And so we know in all throughout every culture, uh, every society, and uh, you know, every race, that man is a worshiper. And so even as they have discovered new tribes or new people, they find they have some form of worship or some type of deity or some, uh, you know, something bigger than them that they, they either put their trust in or they're trying to appease. Uh, when I was in college, we I had to take a, a class on cultural anthropology, and they, we studied the tribes of Mindanao, and this is a... a, a supposedly a, a tribe in the Philippines that they found of these people and they, and they worshipped and it was very closely related to uh, Christianity that the, you know, was a, uh, a god who had a son who came and all these different things uh, so we find this in all of our society and culture and every uh, place on the globe but that being said you know everybody worships something we need to know who or what we serve and then once we discover that, hopefully we'll find the one true God and choose to serve him. And so our story is literally Elijah challenging people to say, hey, pick a God. Any God, but pick one and serve him. And so I want to preach tonight about who is your God, or as they used to say in Bullwinkle, uh, the other title, what is your God? I don't remember if anybody watched Bullwinkle, but... Uh, amen. Back in the day. So uh, 1 Kings chapter 18. I'm just going to read one verse. Verse 21. It said, And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. And so here's the challenge. Uh, the decision we need to make. And in that place they had two choices. You and I are faced with a whole lot more. Amen. So let's consider first uh, God's replacements. There is a big churchy word that I, we're going to talk about. Amen. That's idolatry. And many would see that as, as simply uh, uh, replacing God with an object or uh, some type of uh, you know little uh, image or uh, a false God. Uh, and Literally, that the definition is the worship of idols or a false god. And this can be objects or images or, or whatever type of thing. And so uh, God addressed this in the book of Exodus, in the first two commandments, uh, verses 1 through 5. says, God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, and you shall have no other gods, little g gods, before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath or that is in the water of the earth. Uh, you shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation to those who hate me. And so uh, this is God dealing with idolatry or things that would try to replace him. And this is what humanity does. This is what uh, we need to make sure we don't do. And, or if we do or when we do, we quickly can turn from this because he uses his powerful and potent words. And that's, that's, an, that's, that's hate. We, we live in a day and age we're not supposed to use harsh language, you know, hate speech or whatever. There's hate crimes. I don't know if someone murders somebody. It's just pretty much they hated them anyway no matter what. Uh, but uh, it, God is using this word saying when you use uh, idolatry or you set something up uh, more important than me, an object, or you worship another God, uh, it's hate. And so uh, whatever it might be. And so this is God dealing with all of the, uh, the, the objects and all of the, uh, you know, the, the carvings of their day and age. And so uh, you know, we live in a day and age where we still have to face this and that. This is why we, we don't have little statues and uh, you know, little Jesuses and, uh, carved or little Mary in the corner or whatever. Little Francis the sissy, uh, this and that. All the little uh, uh, you know, marble statues. Amen. This is why we uh, encourage people not to have any type of object that would become religious. Uh, you know, a cross or a, or a picture of uh, some Californian guy uh, that looks real nice and quaint with this beautiful flowing blonde hair. Amen. Really attractive, uh, uh, and uh, then he's well. Who's that? That's uh, Jesus. Probably not. But uh, and you know, don't make an image of anything. Don't don't make a, a, an object to have any type of 
uh, uh, of religious significance. The word cross is in the New Testament letters only 11 times. So in all of the epistles, all the writings of the letters, it's only in the Bible 11 times. It's twice in two verses. Uh, and he's basically talking about the power of the cross or the redemption. And it's never as an object to focus upon. It was actually Constantine who was deciding to combine paganism and Christianity, have more followers, that decided, hey, I'm going to put that on my flag or on my coat of arms or my shield. And the cross will now become a symbol of reverence for the believers. It was not the apostles. It wasn't the people of God. Amen. It was a, a pagan king, basically. And so... We, and we, we understand that, amen. If it, you know, we, you, perhaps you've seen people you sit, sit, you know, kneeling at an object or a, 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 a marble statue, amen. I once went to the place called the Grotto up in uh, Portland, and a uh, pretty cool garden. Uh, you know, these neat, you know, about 15 foot tall statues of, uh, like I said, Frank, Saint Francis the Sissy and all these guys. Uh, that you, they would. Uh, there's people, these little people sitting there, and they're praying to these cards. And I thought that's just. But, uh, amen. And so this is what he's talking about. Don't make any carved image. And uh, what good does that do? So there's, and so we hopefully understand that. Amen. You don't, you don't, you don't have any little objects or little statues in your home. Uh, you know, little Mother Mary and uh, whatever. You've gotten rid of all those or little golden Buddhas or anything else like that. Uh, but there's also the outright denial of God. And, and the choice to worship something else. And so this is what uh, Elijah is coming at. That people were saying, I'm, I'm gonna, I believe in Baal. And this is a, a fertility religion, amen. And all the uh, uh, demonic involved in that. Uh, this is the attitude of Pharaoh. He had his own gods. Exodus chapter 5 verse 2. Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I don't know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. And so this is, you know, going back to the sermon this morning, here is the attitude uh, that Pharaoh had. I don't know, who, who is the Lord? Who, who is He? And I don't know Him. And so therefore, I'm not going to uh, listen to Him. And we live in a day and age where the atheism, the scientists, have, there's, this is going on. Amen. People do this. I don't believe in God. And so this is the outright denial to worship something else. And typically it's either their own mind, and we'll look at some other things, or their own abilities, or perhaps some other type of uh, inner peace or nature or whatever. Uh, Gaia, you know, something else. They add to the different names, uh, which basically is a good name for Satan. So what are the things then that can take God's place for you and I, though? Because like I said, none of you have statues, none of you are... Uh, uh, you know, kneeling to you know wooden emblems or whatever, uh, burning incense to some uh, uh, deity. We have to deal with other things that want to take God's place. Probably one of the biggest is money or material things. That there's a spirit upon that. In fact, it, as it speaks in Matthew six uh, verse twenty four, no one can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one. And love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And mammon is the Syriac name for the God of money. He says you have to pick a God here. And some would choose to serve the God of money and, and seek after that and try to get that. Because money has power. And get you what you want. It can make a lot of your problems go away. Uh, you know, if you have enough, you can see uh, a certain doctors, and it can heal you. And do. And you know what? Money can take the place of God. And so we have to be careful that we don't allow it that type of power, and uh, we don't serve mammon. Matthew 19, 21, 22, Jesus said uh, to the rich young ruler, If you will be perfect, go and sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. But the young man heard that saying, and he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So here's a man, you know the story, he comes to Jesus, I followed all the commandments, what, do I, what else do I have to do? He knew something was missing. It says Jesus looked at him and loved him. 
You have. You've done everything right. The problem is, bro, you're hung up on your money. You're hung up on material things. Go sell it all. Come follow me. You think that's where the power is. You think that's what the answer is. Hey, sell it all. Come follow me. And the man walked away sorrowful. We never hear from him again. He had great possessions. Those had taken the place. He could keep commandments. He could do rules. He could, he could, you know, walk the line, punch the clock, do everything, all those things. But when it came down to making God Lord and sovereign, oh, I can't do that. Money took the place. Now, money's not that. It's not evil. Obviously, we need it. But it, it takes on a spirit when we allow it to start to replace God. When it has the power, like I said, to heal, when it has the power to make your problems go away. And so therefore there's a tendency that you that that's more the answer rather than God. And so if you're if you're ever praying and, and, and the answer is God, you better do a miracle or give me more money, that's when you know you this is starting to happen. So you'll be loyal to one, amen. Another thing that can replace God is people, family, relationships, and we allow them to become uh, more important uh, than God and, and begin to take the place. This is uh, this was what Adam did in the garden. That when Eve made the choice to listen to the devil and the temptation work, and remember, it says Adam was with her. He's sitting there the whole time listening. He wasn't deceived. He knew exactly what's going on. But when Eve sinned, rather than override that and all the things that he could have done, I know I just preached on that, he could have, he could have said, no, 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 hang on a second. Honey, that's crazy. What are you doing? But she chose to eat that, and so he thought, man, I'm going to lose her. So I'm not going to obey God. I'm going with her. And for a moment, Eve was more important than obeying God. And cursed the entire world it says then after Adam ate then their eyes were opened and then it's like uh oh you know there's that place in the Bible where it says if a wife makes a rash oath and the husband hears it he can override it I don't know if uh, you know Adam was smart enough to uh, name all the animals he probably knew that about God but something happened there in that moment thinking I'm losing her so she became more important than obedience to God. And so Adam committed the first, the original sin, which was high treason. He sold everything out. That's the original sin. Amen. But anyway, uh, Matthew 10, 37. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Now, of course, we would never say, oh, I love my uh, you know, uh, father or mother more than God. Or I love, we wouldn't say that. But in the actions, in the attitudes, is God more important? Or is the emotions or the desires of a, uh, of a person, a, a spouse or, or a child or a you know, parent or, or uh, you know, any other, can they sway you to believe something or do something that what God would say, what are you doing? That's not what I want you to do. Why are you letting them replace me? Like I said, we would never say that because we're good Christian people. We say we love God. Luke 14, 26. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, obviously, we're not supposed to hate anybody. We're supposed to love everybody. Jesus is using this very potent word to describe when, it, when you compare your love for God with everybody else, it looks like, wow, you don't really care for them much. Because you're so utterly devoted to God and the obedience to Him. That if someone wants to go some other way. No, what I do is obey God. Your children, amen. I, we, thank God we haven't had to deal with this, but I've heard this a lot. You know, their uh, children will uh, you know, get to the age and they start to mess up. And uh, I heard Pastor uh, Stevens has preached about this, but have to put kids... Uh, out of church, amen. And uh, as long as it's not my kid, the parents are, yeah, kick them out. But as soon as it's their child, it's like, well, wait a minute here. I thought we're supposed to love them. And uh, the parents will leave with them. 
Rather than obey God and say, yeah, that's, uh, uh, that's how to end. Allow the emotions or the care of a child to, uh, to you know, pull them out of the kingdom. Your spouse goes haywire and goes crazy. Are you going to keep serving God? Or they suck you out of church. Your children go haywire. And I'm saying if, and we pray that that doesn't happen, we believe in God. Who is Lord? So we can allow people to take the place of God. And also, the, probably the worst and the most insidious is when we let us take the place of God. Yourself. Your ambition. Your desires. Your talents. Your abilities. Your opinions can subtly move in and replace God. Well, God, this is what I think. And again, we won't ever say, you know, I'll sit there and argue with the Lord. No, you know what I think, Lord. We'll simply say, well, this is what I interpret. Or this is what I think. Or this is what I, is important to me. And we allow our emotions, our desires, what we want, what we think, who we think God should be, to take God's place. And we enthrone self-will and we say, this is what I'm going to do. And the will of God, uh, uh, you know, whatever it might be, some people never even try to get there because they know it's not their will. It's not what they have planned. And so they start to even head that direction. Isaiah 14, 13 and 14 says, For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend to the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Now those words are obviously uh, said that that's what Lucifer said. I will do this. I'm going to be here. I'm going to go there. I'm going to do this. That's satanic, right? What about when we say Oh, it's opinion. <laughs> it's my, uh, it's, uh, you know, well, I was just, uh, uh, I'm just saying. You know, you know where I'm going to be? You know what I'm going to do with my money? You know what I'm going to be Sunday morning? You know where I'm going to, you know what I'm going to do? Uh, you know, what I, and we start to say that I, 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 this is what I like. You know what I want you to do? And we start to enthrone self. Well, we don't say we're being satanic, do we? Because that's really mean. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, we don't, we don't, I'm being like Peter. Go ahead, call me Satan. I'm just doing what, what I want. Because we're not usually not that harsh on ourselves. But we have to understand that there's a part of us that wants to take God's place. That wants to say, you know what, I know best. And this is what Adam did. This is what you have to fight. If you're able to see that in yourself, that you're trying to override God in your decisions. You know, money is the one of the biggest. We are always trying to override God with money. God, you have no clue how to deal with that. That'll balance my checkbook. Mm -hmm. You have no idea. Lord, do you know? Look. Look how much I don't have. And so the obvious, this is what is known as idolatry. It's not an object. But it's the worshiping of something other than God. And so it's linked in. Listen to this list. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10. Don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators nor idolaters. Second. Adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. We have to call that sin. If you can call the kettle black, amen, you can say that's sin. When, when, when we do that, when we allow that into our lives, then you can get help from God. Okay, the big problem then is what Elisha is dealing with is when we try to mix the two. I serve Jesus. I'm living for... And Baal too. Because there's parts of things that, that, there's part of Baal worship that are cool. In fact, those people are doing it, so I'm going to do it too. And the scripture, it says, well, how long do you falter between the two? Because this is our problem. Because we love God. We're trying to serve God. 
And the problem comes when we falter or halt or stumble between the two. And we try to mix them together. We try to mix our will and God's will. We try to mix uh, uh, money, uh, uh, how we want to do it, and how God wants to do it. We try to mix uh, uh, our relationships and balance them together and say, well, I know they're not good for me to be around. And, and, uh, but, uh, but, you know, Lord, is, He's really tolerant. And we try to mix the two. And that's worse than just going all the way, serve Baal or serve God. This is what Elijah is saying. Serve one. Revelations 3, 15 and 16. I know your works. They're neither cold nor hot, but I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you're lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Jesus with the flaming sword coming out saying, pick one. Go for one. Choose one. This is the soul that is falsely secure and saying, I'm going to serve God and the idol. I'm going to mix the two of them together. And God's saying, no, that's, that's even worse. <clears throat> so this is the state of the vast majority of people who call themselves Christians today. They're mixing them. They're mixing them. Uh, uh, through idolatry and, and there, there's pastors that are they're preaching this and talking about this this morning uh, if you give to God he'll make you rich that's all they're trying to do it's a get rich quick scheme it's money 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 hey, where does he say that you give to God he'll bless you does it say money he might and I, I'm glad when he does and so are you <laughs> but if he doesn't are you mad Lord I paid you when you pay me back I gave you 10%. I'm supposed to. It's something about a hundredfold somewhere in there. When are you going to do that one? Unwilling to let go of the false God. Unwilling to let go of the, the opinion. Unwilling to let go of the relationship of the person. Unwilling to let the, all those and say, you know what? No, I'm going to obey God no matter what. I'm going to make the Lord the Lord. This is the problem. It reminds me of at work. This is the problem. <laughs> that we don't make the Lord the Lord. We obviously understand as a Savior, we need Him to save us. And we want Him to help us. But when it comes to Him lording over us, this is where uh, typically as Americans, it's a free country, we do whatever we want. And, and we, you know, we like democracy and being able to vote and say, I have a choice in this. And God says, no, I'm the Lord. I'm the King. I'm sovereign. I choose. You You follow. Because I know it's best for you that we we don't make him Lord. And so we falter between the two. And so Joshua says in Joshua 24, 15, If it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river, or the God of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that's more than a cute plaque that you put on your door mm -hmm. to keep the Jehovah's Witnesses away <laughs> knocking on your door. That is something we have to decide, right? That we're going to serve the Lord. Me and my house, this is what we're going to do. And we have to constantly uh, deal with the issues of our heart. And, you know, you're, we're not perfect. We know we, we I start talking about money, man. We get uncomfortable. Start talking about, some of you I see start squirming about relationships and people. And, oh, yeah, no, they're not, they're not making me decide and you see the squirming and, uh, and, and, and we understand that we have to deal with these things. But we have to choose day by day. Say, you know what? I'm not going to be God today. God is. The Lord gets to, Lord, He gets to decide. When you wake up, uh, uh, you know, besides coffee or whatever other, uh, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> type of fix you need, amen, uh, what's the next thing you do? Do you spend time with God? Or do you falter? The, the, uh, the King James uses the word halt. It means to stumble or kind of stagger. So rather than just walking straight with God, it's like falling to this side and falling to that side. It's like when my son, you know, we, go, we try to climb up Table Rock, amen, and uh, balance in pairs. 
<laughs> My goodness, uh, you know, you can't take him anywhere because he'll fall off the edge into rattlesnakes and poison oak. And so, uh, amen. Some people are, as Christians live their life like that, man. Stagger over here. Oh, hey, you'll get bit over there. Or, hey, you're going to get a rash. Faltering between the two. Falter means to lose confidence, to become unsure or hesitant, begin to fail. You ever get unsure about God? You ever lose a little confidence? You ever lose confidence that prayer works? You ever lose confidence that going to church helps? You ever lose confidence that making a stand and, and saying something for God, that you ever lose confidence that that is the way to do it? Ever lose confidence that just flat out saying it? You know, you need Jesus. It also means to lose strength, power, or vitality. To falter. That, you know, as I talked about this morning, God wants to be your strength. And so when you're losing strength, a lot of people, they falter. Rather than saying, okay, I'll just be totally weak and let God help me because he's the answer. That's where people start to clamor and grab hold of things. Well, I can do this. I can do that. I can get a payday loan. I can talk to them. Uh, you know what I can do? Uh, I, can, I, I can go out in the woods. Uh, I can, and we start to look for all these other answers. And it also means to stumble or move unsteadily. That defines a lot of people's walk with God. They don't just simply walk with God. And as God says, hey, do this, they say, okay. It's unsteady. It's staggering here and there. I don't know, God, if I can believe you. I don't know if that's the right thing. And you start to mingle the mind and reasoning in there with it. God, that doesn't make sense. Of course it doesn't. It made sense, it'd be easy. It's a math question. It's a math problem then. A plus B equals heaven. And we would simply add A and B and we'd all, hey, it all works. <laughs> it'd be a formula. You ever notice in the Bible, even when Jesus is praying for blind people, he never does it the same way twice? <laughs> this guy, he spits on his eyes. The next guy, he spits in the clay and then puts the clay in his eyes. This guy, he tells him, hey, just go wash in a pool. He does it differently every single time. And so we need to have a relationship with God so he knows, well, what am I supposed to do this time? So many people, they don't have faith and confidence in God, so they stumble along in life. Joshua says in Joshua 24, 23, Now therefore put away the foreign gods which are among you and incline your heart to the Lord your God of Israel. Incline means to lean towards. And every one of you know if you start leaning in a direction, what happens? You fall that way. This is what Joshua says. Here's the answer. If you'll start to lean that way, you have to go that way. You can't stand uh, straight and incline yourself unless you've got really good balance. But that would be... I won't do it because we have a camera and then... Uh, <laughs> And it would cause a big noise. And so uh, Elijah's asking, how long will you falter between two opinions? So what we need is a change of opinion. And so as I finish, amen, uh, Elisha challenges us, follow the Lord. Follow the Lord. If the Lord is God, follow him. And this is a call to total devotion, total surrender, saying, God, I'm going to live your life. I'm going to live the way you want me to live. God desires for his people to need him. Understand that. He desires for you to need him. Not sort of like him. Not sort of include him. Not just add it on there. And Sunday morning at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock, I'm a Christian now. But when I'm with those people, I'm, I, I can't be, you know, or I'll tone it down or I'll, I'll you know, water it down, amen, Christian light.
wants you to allow him to be boss. You, if you have enough kids around you, you'll eventually hear some, you're not the boss of me. How many of her? <laughs> you're not the boss of me. Well, God is. But we'll sometimes argue, we won't say it right. You're not the boss of me, Lord. Yes, he is. Let him be. Let him dictate the rules and the terms. Uh, uh, Matthew, uh, Matthew 22, 37, 38. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. And this is the first and great commandment. Love God with everything you've got. If you start there, he promised he'll make room for your spouse, he'll make room for your kids, he'll make room for mommy and daddy and grandpa and uh, your friends and all the other things. He'll make room for all that. This is the reason for the Bible. We have a book. In the, in the temptation of Christ, the devil takes him out to the wilderness. And Jesus says three times in our, in our scriptures, he says, it is written. And he defeats the temptation. He defeats idolatry. He defeats uh, uh, all of the temptations of the devil by saying, quoting scriptures. Here it's written. How do you follow the Lord? You read how to do it. John 5, 39, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Now Paul is challenging religious people who's, who were reading it, but they were looking for something else, which can be a problem, but I hope that's not the issue. But he says, search the scriptures. They, te they talk about me. They talk about uh, uh, you know, Messiah. And so Jesus is saying, read your Bible. Follow me. Understand how uh, to live this life. The book testifies of who God is. Remember the title of the sermon, Who is Your God? Well, if it's God, follow Him. How? Read. Find out. Study. Give yourself this. You don't have to read the Bible tonight, the whole thing. Just read some of it tonight. Read some of it tomorrow. And the next day? And the next day? If you don't have time? I don't know what to say. Because I bet you do have time. It just depends on who God is. Who's more important? Who is the priority? Because if we don't have time, you know who's on... The throne, amen. It stinks when you're on the throne. <laughs> Let God be God. So if you'll read, you'll know how he acts. You'll know how he responds. You'll learn how and discover how he helps. You know how God thinks? You can place yourself in a position for blessing. If you don't know how God thinks, you'll forever just chase your tail. We had a cute little dog named Phoebe. Half loss of opso, half sheep dog. So it's about two days after you cut her hair, she turned into a mad mess. Ugly, but it was our dog. So it was cute. Phoebe would chase her tail. God's greatest. And so we would get her to help us do this. And we'd sit and laugh. Because <laughs> she did, couldn't figure out it was attached to her, right? <laughs> did this dog lived, it was 16 years old, man, still 14, 15 years old. That dog would still do that. We'd still have her down. Probably gave it a heart attack. That's when it died. But sit and laugh. And when we do that, it's not funny. You know, someone just takes your tail and he's going like this, and all of a sudden you go. <laughs> Woo! Don't chase your tail. Put yourself in a place of blessing. That's that's. I hope that's deep enough that you can get through it. What do you, what do you mean? Let God 
be God. If the Lord is God, follow Him. God is pleased by those who choose that life. They say, I'm going to follow God. I'm going to find out how to follow God. I'm going to do what He wants. I'm going to speak His word. I'm going to, I'm going to handle my money the way He wants to, me to handle it. I'm going to handle my relationships and, uh, and my, my freedom. I'm going to do everything how He wants me to do it. Who is your God? The Lord is following. Let's all bow our heads. Let's close our eyes just for a few moments. Amen. Hallelujah. Before I go any further, amen, maybe you're here as we always do. You're not right with God. God isn't, hasn't been your God whom you devotedly serve and you allowed sin to come into your heart. It's the place where you're backslidden away from God. Now this, uh, you know, whatever you believe in, it might not be from moment to moment, amen, but if you know God can convict your heart still. You're not right. You've done something, as that list says, you've done something and you can't go to heaven. You'd like to rededicate your life to Jesus and confess that sin and pray, ask God to forgive you. Any here this evening, amen, you lift your hand, Every head bowed, every eye closed. God sees his hand. You want to pray. You want to ask Christ to forgive you. Amen. And you lift your hand as well. Say, I want to pray. I want to repent. Amen. Little hands going up. Any adults who did conviction of God touching you saying, God hasn't been my God. He's been an attachment. He's been part of my life. But I haven't let him boss me around. And let him go. And you lift your hand. Or we're changing the order. Amen. This is the eternal battle. You and I, we let things creep in. We let money exert power and pressure on us. Some of you are letting people determine your choices. If you let people determine whether you go to church or not, this is, this is a problem. If you're letting people you know, determine uh, you know, how you tithe or not, or you, uh, you give or not, amen, this is a problem. If you're afraid of like, you know, outreach and witnessing to people, if you're, if you're more afraid of them than them going to hell, and it's going to be a problem. So push those things aside and say, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to do what you want. There's a whole bunch more in that. God wants to help us this evening. Amen. You raise your hand. You want to get right with God. You look up at me. Amen. You mean that? Amen. Could you come? Amen. We need a brother to come up and pray. Say a sinner's prayer with us. Amen, amen, tonight, amen. Lead him in a prayer of repentance, amen. We're going to open these altars and we want to encourage you to come find a place to pray. If there's any place in your life where you can say, oh man, I haven't let him be God. Come up and tell him, sorry. Come up and repent. Let's all stand. These altars are all open. Come and find a place to pray. We're going to Proverbs has 31 chapters in it. Read one a day. You'll never get lost. All you do is look at the date. Oh, yeah. I missed one. Well, let's, let's jump right in there. It's, an inter it never, it's like a not quite a story. 
The book of Acts is 28 chapters. So sometimes you get to get a couple of days off. <laughs> Read a chapter of that a day. The Acts are the Acts of the Apostles, what they did. And you can learn how God dealt with the first church. Or you could just simply you know, get one of those Bibles, read the Bible in a year. Follow the Lord. Find out what He does. And you'll find that the answers to your questions are in there. Every one of them. Even questions you don't even know how to ask yet. They're in there. Amen. So let's follow God. Uh, amen. Uh, let's dismiss tonight. You go love one another. As we close our service, uh, let's all bow our heads uh, and pray uh, tonight. Will, would you dismiss us? Thank you, Father God, for blessing us with the word that you've given us to the Lord, the Lord Almighty. We ask, Father God, that you show us a way that we can go, Father God, and love one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.